Takes his rake and a hoe and a piece of fertile ground. Inch by inch, row by row, someone bless these seeds I sow. Someone warm them from below till the rain comes tumbling down. share their, their dreams, their visions, um, and their issues, and uh, that's just a real privilege to be able to do that. So, so thanks to all those folks. First off, of course, uh, uh, I'm not especially qualified to be uh, in front of here because uh, all the plants I grow are entirely useless and impractical. So, um, you know, strictly hobby, and what's worse, is all the plants that I take care of in, uh, in my day job are dead. And, uh, and, and we like to keep it that way. The older, the better. And of course, uh, when you're interested in change, you are interested in what things were like now, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 200 years ago. So that's where my interests start linking up with climate. I'm not a climate modeler, but I follow things with some care because it is really important to understanding what's happening with natural areas. It's also a rapidly changing field. And uh, I wanted to basically have several take home points and one of them, uh, of course, we're in the Great Lakes region right now. It's beautiful. It's fantastic. I want to comment about a few exceptional things. But before, um, we, we have some interesting advantages for looking at change, largely because we started out with a clean slate about 18,000 years ago. If, if you're a plant, a, a glacier will just ruin your whole day. And so Michigan was entirely covered by the glacier. And it's a, an important thing to understand basically what happened after there, uh, after deglaciation, because it gives us some insight into what's going to happen in the future and how fast it might happen. So, well, there we go. Um, <laughs> You guys should consider yourself lucky. Um, of course, what this is, and the mountains are a dead giveaway, is the, uh, is the great Greenland ice cap. This actually is the last large remnant of our great continental ice sheets. And of course, when I say change, we're thinking climate. And at the glacial maximum, the mean global temperature was somewhere around 7 degrees Celsius. What's that, about 10 degrees Fahrenheit? Um, cooler than now. So I would have needed a thicker jacket. So, <clears throat> and there's a modern day sea level glacier. This is the Bering Glacier in Alaska. 
You see what I mean about wrecking things for plants? And here we start out. There are a few bold things here. I think that's an alder. Um, but it doesn't take long to adapt. This is an interesting view because the Bering Glacier uh, is studied a lot because it moves and then retreats. And the glacial glaciologists were really interested in figuring out why. And it, it's probably because there's enough liquid on the underside to periodically grease it and let it slip forward. But right about here, the, this zone, I think uh, the glacier was right about there and I think 1964. So it's pretty young. Here, around the turn of the century, so it's about not quite a hundred years. And then this spruce forest was under the ice about 300 years ago. Now, of course, here it's going to be much faster than in Michigan because all these plants are just very close by. This is not a big glacier. So this is probably what Michigan looked like. It was a mess. Um, birches, alders, pines, spruce, fir. Um, probably that took 1,000 years, maybe more. And eventually pines came in, different pines, mixed hardwoods, all sweeping through. And finally, we're right where we are now uh, with our hardwoods. It's only going to be a few more months before our forests in this area are going to look just like that. So, so Michigan has changed dramatically in a very short time. So we're looking um, from the perspective of thinking about change in a state that has never seen stability since it left the glacier. So what are we thinking? Well, um, to start with, let's back up just one step further and look uh, at the big picture. Geologists are really good at looking for details and working out things like temperature, oxygen, CO2. And uh, the problem is to get all this for the past few hundred million years onto a slide, it would, it would have to kind of extend over somewhere here. So here, this scale is just about 5,000 year intervals. And there is since the glacier left. Now you can see something interesting. This is a pretty flat, pretty stable zone. A um, little further back, these are the great fluctuations when the glaciers advanced, pulled back, advanced, pulled back. And if you go further back, look at this high point in the temperature. 60 some million years ago, just before the dinosaurs got nailed, they were, uh, they were living it up in climate probably uh, uh, warmer than anything we have on Earth at the present. Somewhere probably about 12 to 14 degrees higher. And then it gets fuzzier as we go back. There's just a couple of things I want to mention. Um, one of them is uh, this great drop in temperature. Now remember, this scale is in millions of years. So this great drop in temperature, if you laid it out on this scale, would be almost flat. It's just that steep because you're compressing it. But, uh, one of the things that I want to point out is this great drop is thought by a lot of people to be the result of the evolution of trees. 
and wood. All of a sudden, now, plants could suck up vast amounts of carbon and hold it in wood and then eventually in coal. And it's actually, uh, a number of people think it's too speculative, speculative, but there are lots of people that think that those trees pulled so much carbon out of the air that they precipitated the great Permian glaciations. Now, of course, this looks like it was really rapid, but that probably took 30 million years. Not rapid at all. But the point is, plants can influence global climate dramatically. And of course, the carbon that they stored, a lot of that is still in the ground. So, a nice stable zone at the end here, except you can see some trouble. So, uh, now another point I want to make that uh, uh, almost every day when listening to the radio, you hear, of course, the usual comment after an exceptionally cold day when it's minus 20 outside. Oh, Let's have some more of that global warming. It's such bunk. It's freezing cold. And of course, uh, I want to draw the distinction between weather and climate as clearly as possible. Weather, weather is what you experience in the short term at a specific place, hour to hour, day to day. It's Michigan. If you don't like the weather, wait a few minutes. It's unstable, and even small disturbances and perturbations in the atmosphere can lead to large changes, including extremes. Little imbalance in the Arctic, and you get this mass of cold air sweeping down and freezing us all out. So um, weather is hard to predict, unstable. Climate, on the other hand, averages over a long time, over large areas. It's shaped by global forces that uh, uh, change slowly the energy balance in the atmosphere. Climate is predictable and it changes slowly in response to global scale forces. So whenever anyone is talking about change, they're not talking about weather, they're talking about climate. And of course, a question that everyone who looks at this says, how can you possibly get record cold temperatures like we had a few winters back when the earth is warming? And of course, it is a precisely that difference. Um, when you get extra warmth in the atmosphere, Heat is energy, and it increases instability right there. And so if you can envision climate and weather being plotted together on some arbitrary line, you can see, you can view this as weather, as, as climate. You can view this as weather, and you can see how even as the average goes up, the extremes can drop the minimum slightly lower. This won't go on forever. But for how long we'll have to endure this, I don't know. So weather and climate are radically different things. And they're really only related in a very general, broad way. So. Um, Next, where does all this begin that we think we actually are doing anything to the climate? Well, it begins in 1958 with a scientist by the name of Keeling who was observing CO2, carbon dioxide, in the atmosphere 
at the top of Mauna Loa in Hawaii. Um, and he began to notice something interesting, starting about here. It was slowly increasing, and it was going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And he realized, and so did a number of people, that carbon dioxide is very much uh, what's termed a greenhouse gas. What that means is that when sunlight hits the earth, what isn't absorbed is bounced back into space. And our global temperature is basically the difference between sunlight absorbed and sunlight popped into space. Carbon dioxide molecules block some of that reflected energy. That's not the only thing that blocks it. Uh, clouds can block it too, but of course clouds are a double-edged sword because they can stop it from coming in too. But carbon dioxide is like glass. It's transparent. And that's where the name greenhouse comes from. So now people filled in this part of the curve. No one was around measuring carbon dioxide in the 1700s, but we can get gas bubbles from ice and other sources and work it out. And uh, this is where we're at. The more CO2 that's in the air, the more heat is retained. That's elementary physics. You can't get away from it. Um, Here's a short section of the curve. Any guesses as to what this up and down thing is? Trees growing and losing their leaves. When they grow, they pull in massive amounts of carbon dioxide. And when they stop growing in the winter, they don't pull it in. And you average it out here. Um, we had a milestone in 2016. That was when carbon dioxide parts per million hit about 400. Uh, that's probably the highest level in the past 25 million years or so. That even predates me. So, so this is where it really began. So what's the problem? Be nice to be a little toastier in the winter here. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, who cares about this? So here's some data you can figure out from various sources, usually air bubbles, what the carbon dioxide was. There's that Keeling curve pointing virtually straight up to 400. And you can also, with somewhat fancier physics, work out uh, global temperatures. And if you put the two together, um, that's where you begin to be concerned. Because you'll notice they are lockstep. Well, what about this? And wherever that's going. So we begin to think that this could be trouble. 400 parts per million. Um, and global temperatures actually do appear to be rising. This scale is pretty tiny. And so there's a huge amount of mess here. I remember when I first came to Michigan almost forever ago, um, there was a biophysicist there who had been looking at this. And he quietly said, because nobody was interested in hearing it at that time, that the impact of carbon dioxide 
on temperature was probably going to come out of the noise of random variation around 1980. And it's amazing how close he was because around 1980 you start seeing before then it's all messy and then slowly you see the rise. And almost every surrogate, you could say, every substitute for temperature, straight temperature, yeah, ocean heat, specific humidity, um, and inverse indicators, snow cover, Arctic sea ice, oh, don't look at the glacier. Anybody wants to see glaciers, do it quick. Um, these are all pretty much giving us the same story. A little more detail. Around 1980, things stop wiggling and start a fairly steady climb. So we think that where this is going to end up is a map something like this in the year 2100. I'll be pretty old by then, so you'll have to get someone else to talk to you. Um, and there are several interesting things about this map. One of them that may not be bad to begin with when you look at it is that uh, a great deal of the warming is in the far north. Why, why should this be? Well, it's for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is that the far north is basically, well, you can say still, pretty much covered the whole time with ice. Now, every little bit less ice there is means more area of brown soil or dark blue ocean both of which absorb a lot more heat than shiny white snow and ice. And so you get what scientists call a feedback loop, a multiplier effect. And that's what's happening. Why should we worry about this? Where's all that water going? It's going into the oceans. So you might be able to uh, go to uh, uh, the inland counties in North America and uh, buy some advanced beachfront. This is probably one of the most worrisome things. Um, but, but keep in mind, and of course that already is part of it, keep in mind that it's much more than temperature that's going on here. Yeah, temperature's going to warm. Precipitation is going to alter, and that's really hard to figure out. But I'll give you some thoughts in a bit. Reduction of ice and snow cover, and as well as permafrost, and directly linked to it, this. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen here. Why increase the acidity? Well, CO2 dissolved in water increases the acidity of water. Um, and this is something that is also going to be hard to predict, but there will be more and nastier and maybe longer extreme weather events. Longer hot spells, uh, longer rainstorms, harder rains. Uh, very hard to predict. Why? Because, well, because they're weather. So they're very unstable and erratic. Well, what's the big problem, though? Didn't we just go through all this uh, about 16,000 years ago? A huge change. Well, uh, one of the problems with people trying to visualize this is it's very difficult for people to really try and even out their uh, views incorporating time spans vastly longer than a human lifespan. 
It's really hard to envision a thousand years. It's almost impossible to envision 10,000 years. These changes are actually happening a good deal faster than those dramatic changes after the glacier. And then there's another thing that's much harder to deal with. Uh, extremes are what really determine the limits of organisms, not averages. I'll point out one important fact that, that people often overlook. Um, we didn't care about what happened back then because we weren't there and we didn't have any infrastructure to cause problems. So what's this business with extremes? So why aren't there any palms in Jackson? If you look at the average January low, what, I, it must be very close to this. Um, and these palms, for short periods, can withstand temperatures as low as minus 9 Fahrenheit. Why don't we plant them? Well, because they would be killed every time there was an extreme event. It's the extremes that are critical to life. And that's, uh, of course, what makes what's going to happen in the future a little harder to predict. It won't be just a little gentle warming that's going to affect us, um, especially infrastructure and gardens and agriculture. What's it going to be? Extreme events. More energy, more instability. The average temperatures are climbing very slowly, fast by geological standards, but very slowly by our standards. But winter and summer extremes of both temperature and precipitation are going to be increasing their magnitude, at least for a while yet. What other crazy stuff is going to happen? Well, we think uh, that while we may get some increased rainfall, that the interior of the continent, the Great Plains, are probably going to dry out. Um, we don't remember back to the Dust Bowl, but when the dust comes east this time, it's going to be laden with all sorts of things we don't want. And there's other things that are going to be an issue. Increased CO2, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Increased nitrogen and also increased temperatures are going to favor invasive species. And this will include plant pests and plant pathogens. So these are some uncertainties that are hard to still deal with. Um, you can prepare for uncertainty, but only up to a point. Um, what's happened up to now? I mentioned that 1980 figure. What's happened since 1980? Um, a lot of people can relate to that. Um, annual precipitation in Michigan has actually gone up very slightly. Most people couldn't detect 4.5%. I mean, it would be a great interest rate for a checking account now, but it's still going to be pennies. Um, and actually, in southern areas of the state, the increase is a little more. Uh, Michigan's annual average air temperature increased very slightly. But the increase is mostly in the winter. That's actually pretty good news. Uh, summer water temperatures increased a little bit on Lake Superior. The Great Lakes are thawing earlier and freezing later. And the frost-free season is longer. Well, ah, this is all good news, I think. But, well, there's the Great Lakes ice slowly dropping. So what's looking ahead? 2070. I might make it to 2040. We'll see. I'm tough. Um, notice, consistent with the pattern we saw, for the whole Earth, more warming in the north. 
Um, not going to go up to the UP to bask in the cool spring breezes in July. Not anymore. Um, a, little, uh, a little unnerving, but also very uncertain. Um, the number of really extreme rain events is going to increase. Not much, but all it takes is one if you're living by a lake or a river. So looking towards the end of the century, summarize temperatures probably 2 to 7 degrees, mostly in the winter, mostly in the north, and, uh, and at night time. Night temperatures are going to be up. Number of dangerous heat days, the kind that you don't want to be inside in an apartment without air conditioning, are going to be substantially increased. Um, much less certain. Uh, higher temperatures produce less ice on the Great Lakes. What does that mean? It means that the water is exposed to the air for longer and more of it can evaporate. Um, if that was the only thing going on, you'd potentially get a significant decrease in lake levels. Great for cottages, bad for shipping. Um, what impact precipitation is going to have is really hard to be sure. It may balance some of that. Um, we're going to have more frequent rainstorms. And unfortunately, uh, uh, the climate models to date uh, aren't very uh, helpful because it looks like most of the increase in heavy rainstorms are going to be in the spring when plants don't need it and less rainfall during the summer when they do need it. It's exactly the opposite of what you'd hope for. So that's, that's generally what we're looking at. Why is there any uncertainty? I just said that climate can be predicted with some level of, of assurance, but not weather. Well, two things. One, of course, we're trying to look ahead a century. Anybody who tries that should have their head examined. But we have good math, and uh, you got to have something to plan for, something to check against, something to test. Uh, a lot of it looks good, but where are the problems? Clouds are extremely difficult to model. I already mentioned that they were a two-edged sword. They block heat from going out, but they also prevent heat from coming in. So the net impact is really hard to work with. Uh, modeling ocean currents is very complicated. Feedback effects. Remember I mentioned the feedback effects? with melting ice, exposing more soil, exposing more area to absorb heat, increasing the melt of ice, and you get a loop. Uh, that's very hard to predict. The math is complex, and it's all done by computer programmers who sit in darkened rooms and smoke too much. And so, you know, you got to realize it's a tough problem. Climate modelers always worry about uh, something that, that they don't like to mention, uh, a tipping point. Um, if you're rolling a big boulder and you get too close to the edge of a steep hill and it accidentally gets away from you, oops, that's a tipping point. So we are in a position where people worry that there might be a point past which the natural controls on climate start operating too little and, and you get runaway warmth. Back to the way it was, for example, in the age of the dinosaurs. 
we don't want to have an average temperature 14 degrees Celsius warmer than it is now. That would be bad. Um, but it may sound dire. It may sound uh, dramatic. But I, I do want to also mention that for all this direness, our summers are going to be roughly like southern Missouri, northern Arkansas. I mean, this is not hell. It's a really nice place to live. And our winters are going to be like, say, Ohio, southern Ohio. And aside from their football team, it's a pretty nice place too. <laughs> so, so, you know, we're, we're good. Um, so it's, it's not exactly the temperature that's going to be the problem. And, uh, and so I, I do want to emphasize that. It's, it's not strictly that. It's, number one, it's the rapidity of the change. Can organisms adapt? Why is that an issue? Well, you know, we've kind of messed the landscape up a little. Uh, they probably could have adapted if we weren't around. So we bear some responsibility for some of the dramatic effects that might happen. Um, now, on the plus side, we've got the Great Lakes. They are a tremendous stabilizing and buffering influence. All that water, uh, we're going to be sheltered from a lot of the real extremes of the climate. And we're also going to be sheltered from a lot of the impacts that might suggest, that might in many areas mean a warmer climate would be much drier. It's a lot of water here. So thank the Great Lakes. They are going to make Michigan the place to move to in 100 years. Keep that in mind. Uh, so what's going to happen to plants? And animals. Will southern things move up into here? All you gardeners would be in serious trouble if armadillos hit Michigan, let me tell you. So um, yeah, southern organisms will move north. Plants, it's going to be very slow. Well, have you ever seen a plant move? I mean, they just sit there. So very slow. The slowest will be long-lived species that are slow dispersers. I'm talking about trees. Greatest change, animals, birds, they can fly. In plants, you'll get some shifting abundances, shifting dominance. There's a scary scenario. In Ohio, they're worried that the buckeye will become extinct, and not only that, move into Michigan. Oh dear. That's really bad science. Don't worry about it. Um, what about this? Are our tamarack trees going to scoot out of here and move north, where you have to drive up to Petoskey to see them? Well, yeah, but not right away. Um, and, and not only that, but this change has been going on for a long time. Because it started not with shifting temperatures, but with clearing of the land and altering of the wetlands. So what do we see? Look at this beautiful little orchid. If you look at all the locations that this has ever been recorded from in Michigan, it's kind of about like that. Well, I've added Ontario because I, I had a map. Um, so you'd think, yeah, just pop on the car in a couple hours north and you're going to see it. Well, look at these dates. I mean, it hasn't been seen here in some cases since the 1840s. So um, even by 1980, which was when things just started warming, it was already up to here. So we've driven things northward already. And this is not going to stop. This is going to accelerate. 
So soon you'll have to go to the Keweenaw Peninsula and Isle Royale to see this thing, uh, conceivably within my lifetime. What about southern species moving northward? Well, that's really hard to do. Why? Because wherever you want to move to, somebody's already sitting there. But there are some things that occupy what ecologists call open niches, spots that there's nothing present. This little autumn coral root is one, and you can see in the published volume one of Michigan Flora, that's where we had it. Uh, by 2016, it's already up to Lake Superior. Orchids have tiny dust-like seeds, very dispersible. They'll move readily. So, forests, what can we see? Well, here, trembling aspen, you know, it just barely gets south of Michigan. A lot of these southern populations are probably going to disappear. We might be hard pressed in a century or two to see that in southern Michigan. On the other hand, sugar maple, I mean, it's going to be a long time for a plant that's perfectly adapted to northern Arkansas to move past. So we're not going to see any change very soon there. What about this plant? Poison ivy. Oh, well, um, you've probably seen articles about how poison ivy is going to do really great with the warmer climate. Why? Well, it's not because it likes it warm. It's because carbon dioxide is, after all, a plant nutrient. So when you increase the CO2, you're fertilizing the landscape. Now, what's wrong with that? Sounds great. But think about native plants. If you pour a ton of fertilizer on a trillium, what's going to happen? Is it going to get six feet high? Nah, you're going to kill it. It's not adapted to deal with that. You pour a ton of fertilizer on poison ivy, and what's going to happen? You better watch out for the vines at night in your bed. <laughs> They'll come and get you. So plants adapted to taking advantage of nutrients and growing quickly and dominating everything are going to do really well. The Bill Gates of the plant world are going to do really well. Uh, we call them weeds. So there is, a, there is an issue there. Um, but at its basic, I would say the earth and its biodiversity will adapt. You'll have some losers. It will adapt. What's the problem? Well, until recently, and until just now, uh, essentially all human infrastructure, cities, transportation, building codes, zoning, resource extraction, management policies for everything, urban planning, water laws, all of them are really based on the premise that things are going to be the way they are now into the future. And this is not true. It never was true, but now it's really not going to be true. Adapting humanity will be very expensive. God, we can't even fix the roads. How are we going to, how are we going to adapt to these kind of things? It's not undoable. We can do it, but it's not going to be cheap. And of course, these impacts are not inevitable. Things you can think about to do. Reduce your own greenhouse gas emissions. Lots of literature on how to do that. Minimize pressure on the environment from your lifestyle. Um, sure, be flexible, willing to adapt. Support young people. They're the one that's going to have to live in this environment. Um, support science and research. Let me tell you that it's too late now, definitely too late, to keep our temperatures from warming too much just by cutting emissions. We're past that point. We need technology and science to help us 
get rid of some of that stuff. Educate yourself. Don't be surprised that everything you read on the web is not true. Whew. A lot of vested interest in the status quo. I love the term alternative facts. So I would say in a very real sense, global change is a, really a sociological and an economic problem. It's not a scientific problem. What do you want to do in your yard? Mulch a lot. Store rainwater. Get rid of your darn lawn. Good night. All this mowing within your community. I'll, I'll probably have some different things to suggest than a lot of people. Conserve wetlands. Why? Well, there's two reasons for that. One, uh, wetlands actually, some of them, especially peatlands, fens, bogs, they can store more carbon even than forests. And that's not often appreciated. And also, those kind of wetlands are the most biodiverse. Uh, conserve stream and river corridors. You want plants to move, animals to move, those are the corridors that they'll move on. Work to control and contain runoff. Keep your water clean. Our puny gas and oil in Michigan in a century is going to be nowhere near as valuable as all the fresh water we are sitting on. Take good care of it. That's probably the single most important thing. Every, anything you can do to help the quality of Michigan's water is going to be a huge boost. And I know that doesn't seem like it fits with combating warming, but it's going to take a lot of resources to do that. And this is one of our best resources. One last thing about staying informed. Whew. There. That's why it's important to be informed. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. You've got to be kidding me. Light a lucky and you'll never miss sweets that make you fat. <laughs> Holy creeps. 2,629 physicians who maintain that luckies are less irritating than, to the throat than other cigarettes. 20,629. No, I don't believe it for a minute. So, watch out for articles that uh, do things like claim that climate change is all a fraud, but, but in fact, if it were true, it would be a good thing because fewer people would freeze to death in the winter in cities. Well, yeah, they'd live until the summer fried them. Whew. Environmental effects of increased atmospheric carbon dioxide. This is interesting because it actually contains a uh, grain of truth. That's a lie. That's true so long as you count weeds as being a lush environment. Well, you can tell where these guys get their funding. Um, watch out for journals that publish articles on absolutely everything. They're fake. Oh my god, I don't even want to think about that. Get rid of it. That's what you should be looking at. That's actually, I think, a paraphrase of Thomas Jefferson. But Reagan said it better. Um, you need to educate and learn about the issues. Now, unfortunately, being at the University of Michigan, I don't always have that luxury. Um, you know, th this is what I have to deal with with students. John Kerry, did you really say that? Yes, he did. No, that's not in the Constitution. What I tell them? Yeah, but only before you take your finals. <laughs> no. Off with them. Off with their heads. Anyway, um, you have a chance to really 
make an impact. I just loved all the things I heard, the awards, and all your work to conservation. You're all doing the right things. Hopefully, I've given you a little bit of, uh, of an impression of what scientists are thinking, uh, some of us anyway, and, and uh, what we can do and, and what we can look forward to and what we can't. Thank you.